Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pandemic Architecture, a virtual symposium organized by the Master of Architecture students at X University, formerly Ryerson University. My name is Jasmine, and my colleague here is Jeanette, and we'll be your hosts for tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to start with land acknowledgements, as the university is located in Toronto. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. As architects and designers who make their marks on the land with physical structures, we not only have to be critical of our environmental impact on the earth, but also our relationships with and impact on First Peoples of the land to which we are settlers too. In August 2021, the university announced that it would begin a renaming process to address the legacy of Egerton Ryerson for a more inclusive future. The symposium is an annual event hosted by the first year Master of Architecture class in the Department of Architectural Science. From the selection of the topic and to the selection of the speakers and moderator, the event is planned entirely by the class. The theme for this year's symposium is titled Pandemic Architecture. The global pandemic has substantially impacted the way we live, pushing the field of architecture to completely shift the way it operates. These past two years of living in fragments caused by the pandemic have paved the way for new avenues of design. With the lessons we learned from COVID-19, as well as pandemics of previous generations, this event will explore the ways in which we see architecture moving forward in the next generation. The virtual symposium will give speakers the opportunity to share their insights, perspectives, and in ideas to address how architecture can better respond and navigate through the recent pandemic. Tonight's event will be split into two sections. For the first half, we'll have a succession of 15 minute talks by our four invited speakers. Then for the second half, we will begin a group panel discussion with our speakers and moderator. At the end of the panel, we invite the audience to ask any questions in the Q&A feature below. Before we introduce our speakers and moderator, I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors. So thank you to KPMB, WZMH Architects, BDP Quadrangle, Con, Con Partnership Architects, ERA Architects, SVN, MCM, the Toronto Society of Architects, NUF Architects, Moriyama and Tashima, as well as Partisans in the Studio, Deeple Architects, Nova Toyona Architects, and the Department of Architectural Science. Now I'll pass it on over to Jeanette to introduce our speakers and moderator. Thanks, Jasmine. So today we are joined by four speakers and our moderator. So starting off with our speakers, our first speaker is Anne-Marie Adams. Anne-Marie is an architectural historian specializing in the intersections of architecture, medicine, and gender. She's jointly appointed in the Peter Guahua Fu School of Architecture and a Department of Social Studies of Medicine at McGill University where she holds the Stevenson Chair in the History and Philosophy of Science, including medicine. Her research addresses the role of the built environment in shaping conceptions of medicine and health. Our second speaker is Steven Verderber. He's a professor at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design and at the Della Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He is a researcher, practitioner, registered architect and the director of the Center for Design and Health and Innovation. His interests lie within health and design, therapeutics, and has engaged in pro bono community projects in New Orleans after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Stephen is a co-founder of the Los Angeles and New Orleans R2ARC and has received the American Institute of Architecture Architects AIA Education Award. Our third speaker is Dr. Celeste Alvaro. Dr. Celeste Alvaro is the principal and founder of Methodologica an applied design research and evolution firm that specializes in assessing how the design of the built environment impacts human behavior, social interaction, and well being. Dr. Alvaro's research is focused on the application of well established quantitative and qualitative research methods and measurement techniques 
and innovative ways to understand the direct and indirect effects of the built environment on users in both her academic and consulting roles. Last but not least, our fourth speaker is Beatrice Colomina. She is an internationally recognized architectural historian and theorist who has reflected on architecture, art, technology, and media. She is a founding director of the Interdisciplinary Media and Modernity Program at Princeton University, and also the university's professor and director of graduate studies in the School of Architecture. Her work provokes the question of how illness and imaging technology has changed our conception of architecture. And finally, our moderator is Dr. Lisa Landrum. Lisa is an associate professor and associate dean of research in the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba and registered architect in the Manitoba and New York State. She is working with the RAIC, CALA, and CCUSA to mobilize an architecture policy for Canada and is leading the CAFE Canadian Architecture Forum on Education Consultations. Dr. Landrum holds a professional Bachelor of Architecture from Carleton University and a Master's and PhD in Architectural History and Theory from McGill University. Her scholarship on architectural agency and the role of the architect has been presented and published internationally. We would like to thank you all for taking the time again today to be a part of this year's symposium on pandemic architecture. Now we will begin with the presentation starting with Anne-Marie. Okay. Well, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And um, what I thought I would do tonight is to present 10 points, 10 things I've observed over the last two years in 26 slides. And these come from my um, recent writings on COVID. And you see the list here. And I, in each case, I'll use one or two pieces of architecture or photographic evidence um, to show you what I mean. And I wanna say, off the bat that I really simplified them a bit, exaggerated them to make them more provocative for our discussion tonight. And also that it will be very fast paced because I'm gonna hit you with a lot of slides very quickly and um, well, hang on. Oh, So my first and one of my main points is about the rising importance of the interior over the pandemic. And I should say too that I'm using photos from the New York Times um, publication 2020 in photos. Uh, interiors are, are, have become more important obviously because we have all been confined at home. And I guess one of my main points here is because our own worlds are suddenly so contained, we're willing to invest more in them. More time, more money, and more study will be devoted to the interiors. And so I wrote about this in a, on the Australian blog, one of my favorite blogs, Parlor, Women, Equity, and Architecture. And Lisa, maybe you could put the link in the chat. Um, and of course, in the Society of Architectural Historians, there's a group in, in interiors. So that's another piece of evidence. So in the Parlor piece, I actually showed that there'd been no change in the use of the word interior, but our, I think our houses have never been in better shape. Cocooning and nesting as it's called was expected after 9-11, but I think um, our stay at home life has been um, different this time under COVID. Uh, our consumption is kind of curtailed, so we work with what is at hand. And in the parlor piece, I challenge readers to, to come up with new vocabulary because so much of our COVID language has been architectural. Confinement, bubble, social distance, for example. So also obvious, I think, is that our houses have become our workplaces, our schools. And in the case of my own family, a dance studio. This is my daughter, our daughter. So our homes now are the only places, or until very recent, the, o the only places in our lives. And in architecture, of course, this is a huge idea that other places might matter to us less. Point number two uh, is that Victor I think Victorian houses have really um, risen and become really evident as the best suited uh, house type for working from home. 
I wrote my dissertation on sickness in the Victorian home. Here it is here and on sickness in the city. Uh, and the first chapter is on the International Health Exhibition, uh, whose plan is shown here on the right. So the Victorian house plan, of course, was comprised of separate rooms. It had discrete circulation. People could close themselves off from each other, very unlike the Parisian apartment. And I think um, what COVID has done is inspired a, a, an awakening or reawakening of the appreciation of Victorian architecture. And certainly in my life, I've been working on this stuff for 30 years, but suddenly the things I work on are of interest to journalists. So some people think of me as a, as a researcher who mostly studies hospitals, but actually I got my start studying houses and I really still dabble in that uh, now and then. My dissertation used, my Berkeley dissertation used stuff like this, Dr. T. Pridge and Teal's um, house sections from the International Health Exhibition, where Dr. Teal blamed houses and architects for diseases that spread. And so at that time, the house was seen not as a refuge, but as a fearful place. And um, there's lots of work, of course, on how sicknesses like tuberculosis shaped architecture with sleeping porches and ventilation. Uh, and with colleagues, David Theodore and Kevin Schwartzman, I've written about how, build, how um, hospital buildings have served as medical technologies in the journal Technology and Culture. So Lisa, there's another link to that article for the chat now, thanks. And this has caused um, incredible tensions between the medical and architectural professions. This is one of the things I study is how doctors and architects think about um, disease through the built environment. And since 2016, I've been lucky enough to actually work in a faculty where I get to observe every day how medical people talk about a uh, place. And this is one of my, this is the last illustration in architecture in the failing way with the rat on the architect's drafting table. Point number three is design for sickness. Until about World War II, houses were designed for sickness, anticipating sickness. Uh, and we see that especially in a room called out on the plans called the sick room. We have tons of paintings uh, and photographs documenting these rooms. And um, here I'd like to make the point that the genre of paintings like Edward Monk's sick room on the left are remarkably similar to photos from, from 2020 and 2021 like you see on the right. There's always a bed, a religious image, and a mix of medical, religious, and family figures. Point number four, that this new importance of interiors um, ampl is amplified by media images of empty public space or empty public schools, especially. These are two photos by architecture graduate uh, student, Francis de Pietro of our beloved McDonald Harrington building, the McGill School of Architecture, which has mostly been empty for two years. And at a discussion forum with global mayors, the mayor of Milan talked about this, the subconscious impact on us of being flooded every day with images of familiar public places, but they're empty. So we really never seen these places empty during the day. And this is of course Place des Arts in Montreal. So I have um, three images here from the New York Times in photos just of examples of what I mean of how shocking it is to see these iconic places empty. Point number five is the impact of social media. So here I point to the, the, the uber popular Twitter account, Room Raiders, I hope you all know it, which rates, really it rates politicians through their room settings. It's pretty uh, funny. It's voyeurism to an extreme, but I'm really interested in how it, it domesticates media personalities. And here's one on the left from J Jason Kenney just from today. And of course the Bidens got 10 out of 10 on election day. And speaking of the White House, the second part of, influ of the influence of social media, I think is due to Trump and his COVID. That's point number six, home as a refuge, where the White House is the illustration and the, and the, the, 
the exaggeration, the extreme example is the expulsion of Trump from the White House as soon as he got his positive diagnosis, showing that home is not where you should be and needing a helicopter to get to, the, to a local hospital was part of the imaging of this, that you must fly away quickly. Point number seven, this, this is a changing view of hospital space, blurring with the domestic. This is, of course, a huge tension in uh, hospital design. Stephen's written about this too, where that good hospitals in some people's minds look like homes. So it follows that the best health care, for example, for the president is the homiest. Point number eight, hospital as opposite of refuge, um, that the walls don't work or they don't matter. And I had to find a way to include this slide because it shows John Evans and hospital architect Eb Zeidler, who recently died, talking about their project of McMaster, which was, of course, all about the power of hospital walls, uh, but this time for flexibility. So the proof of walls not mattering is that we have basically returned to the pavilion plan arrangement in the temporary COVID hospitals. These big open arenas of, of COVID patients are just like Nightingale wards where only air and space separates beds. So this is probably my most important point or most original one, and that is that the new hospital wall is PPE or the PPE, the personal protective equipment is the new hospital wall. Most of us didn't even know what PPE was two years ago. And now instead of bricks and mortar walls, <coughs> brick and mortar walls, we wear clothing that does the job formerly done by the walls. And of course the mask is the example that we're, <laughs> we're mostly wearing ourselves all day. And so um, I'd point to this article in The Guardian where um, I think it's one of the best articles written on hospitals and COVID by Laura Spinney and Lisa has the, um, the link for the chat in that. And that points to, leads to point nine, which is also about walls. And I think what COVID has done is made the, th the threshold or the facade of houses that marks the line between private and public much more important and much more celebrated. And sometimes, of course, we mark places that are important but have no architecture yet. An example is where the spots where people are killed in car accidents along busy freeways. But during COVID, it's been the front wall of the house as the great divide. It's where we hang the hand-drawn rainbows. And this again is my house. Uh, and of course, it's, it continues a long tradition of marking the front door when there is sickness or death in the house. Uh, black ribbons have been a symbol of mourning and crosses on doors during the Black Plague marked sickness. I have two amazing shots here of this important border of COVID versus non-COVID space. Like before, photo images of COVID echo what artists picked up on in the 19th century. We're putting an enormous amount of cultural energy into the facades of buildings, now our sole place of encounter. And here you see, uh, <laughs> again, an example from art history that is so close to um, the photographic documentation of COVID. And then finally, point 10, I call living in the grid. Um, Zoom, of course, has been the great de democratizing um, structure. City grids have not proven to be so. And again, I quote from The Guardian in a piece about how COVID has rewired our brains. The journalist said, in contrast, pandemic cues are not organic. They are a series of regularly spaced people being processed by a wayfinding system. And I think that's our new spatial order. In addition to one-way traffic systems that we learned from grocery stores, we're now living in gridded patterns. And so I end here, oh, two minutes early, um, where we started. Uh, and our, the final proof is to look at us in our, in our gridded composition here today. Um, and that, that our Zoom, what I'm trying to say is our Zoom comp uh, composition that you'll see in a moment when I stop sharing screen is exactly like this kind of photo. I think it is the new architecture. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. So up next, we have St Stephen with their presentation. Oh, and Stephen, you'll need to unmute. There. Now it's full screen, right? Okay, I have to go back, scroll to top here. This is, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And it's great to be with all of you this evening. Um, this is the, um, I'm presenting um, uh, a summer, I'm gonna uh, speak and elaborate on uh, a white paper that was written that I um, developed that summarized the first uh, year of um, the architectural response to the pandemic. So this covers the year, this covers the period from um, March of 2020 to about March of 2021. And it's titled Pandemical Healthcare Architecture and Social Responsibility, COVID-19 and Beyond. And what it, um, I conducted a survey with my research assistants of, our, of what uh, built and unbuilt proposals uh, in response to the need for um, facil healthcare facilities in response to the pandemic. And so there were um, the two aims of this investigation were to, um, to review, we ended up reviewing 24 or 18 unbuilt and built projects from around the world that we classified into four different types. So we established a typology. These were uh, redeployable walk-up, drive-up, pop-up testing and or immunization facilities that could be autonomous and self-contained. Or And the second type is nomadic testing and immunization facilities in a mix of vehicular uh, um, vehicles with rollout and pop-out elements. And the third is a pop-up unit, which, is, which can be installed in a repurposed host structure. The fourth is a freestanding exterior autonomous surge capacity field hospital, which could be used for uh, in, um, infection control treatment or as uh, quarantine housing, typically sited on a medical center site um, with an umbilical cord linkage to a mothership hospital. So the first type, and the second objective aim was to look at all of these um, examples from the standpoint of their salutogenic or biophilic content, which means, and some of you might be familiar with these terms, salutogenic design, which is uh, wellness supporting. Biophilia can, uh, denotes connectivity with nature, um, landscape through views and other means of um, con contact with the exterior world. And um, so the, the first one is uh, here is, it's a, um, a walk-up facility in Santa Monica um, by an LA firm. And you walk up to the window and you, uh, you, your sample is taken, your nasal swab sample. And it, to me, a little bit like buying a hot dog at a hot dog stand. And so it was very much like, uh, it reminded me of the tale of the pup, which is a very famous hot dog stand that Charles Jenks wrote about a long time ago in his book on the language of postmodern architecture. I think he published it in that book. And how these would be set up all over the city. Here it is on the Hollywood um, walk, of, um, walk of Fame. And these are, there's, this is an example from um, in the United States presented, uh, developed by Grimshaw, which is an, um, a repurposed um, standard shipping container. And there are many um, permutations. It even has solar collectors on the roof. And that, so both of these are walk-ups. This is a third walk-up, which is developed in part by a firm based in Toronto, um, Parkin Architects, working as, as part of a consortium. There are eight variants on this structure. This also has solar panels on the roof. So this is another walk-up. This is type two, which is an example of a nomadic facility that could be uh, deployed to schools. And it has a pop-out 
element with the tent on the side. And so it's, a, it's for testing. And also there's a lab on board to, um, to analyze the um, samples that are obtained. This example, the third type is a pop-up in a repurposed host structure. This is uh, a group, um, an architecture and art student group from Berlin proposed these, which would be um, inserted in existing structures. Uh, curiously, the, the staff person is inside the pneumatic bubble and the patient is outside. So I've, this is very curious. And you can see how there would be arrayed in these long rows, similar to um, like maybe a Nightingale ward, but the patients are on the outside. So the, then this is a, um, an example from Germany, which was to be set up in the air airport in Berlin, the new airport, as a series of modular uh, bays for, it's a, it's a treatment facility. So the, the, the um, terminal is converted into a hospital in this case, in this proposal. But there's, there's a sort of ethereal quality here, which I find a little troubling. It's as if this is what a hospital room might look like in the life thereafter, with the halo above and the light source. And you're in these little pods. It's very much of a, uh, it's quite futuristic, like something from um, some movie from the future, like that great Tom, what's that um, Tom Cruise movie? that I can't think of the name of right now. This example is in uh, China. This, these are testing facilities. They are uh, pneumatic inflated structures. Like this, in this case, it's inside of a, a sports facility. And then um, I conducted a, a graduate studio. We pivoted at the last minute last fall, in fall of 20, um, in fall of 20 to, um, to look at, uh, pop-up architecture and repurpose host structures and also freestanding uh, COVID sur uh, surge hospitals, which would be the fourth type. So we were looking at um, type three and type four in the studio. And these type three examples, here's one which is a bit interesting. The students in this case, they took a, uh, a church which was repurposed. It's an existing host structure. And then a lift pack system is designed and brought in as an intervention and then assembled and all the life support and, and uh, HVAC support is brought in in, in terms of, um, for, so it could be either self-sufficient or it could run off the power and the HVA systems of the existing building. Here, the uh, idea, these clinics are so boring and they're often in such ad hoc spaces that in this case, they thought they would commission the work of local Toronto area artists. And, they, and these panels, these polycarbonate panels could be um, sort of in, infused with this, this art so that the in, interior environment can become enlivened. And so, and so the patients have something to see and experience while they're there and to maybe take their mind off of why they're there. And the, the students, were on, an, on a national public radio, um, um, they were interviewed um, about this project um, a couple months after the studio ended. And other examples here. So each of these are analyzed. Here's a, this is a, a, beer, uh, a vacant beer store on um, Dundas near Ossington in Toronto that is repurposed as a pop-up clinic. And the theme here is uh, biophilia so that these modules have plants in them and murals and uh, full spectrum lighting. And the idea is to uh, incorporate nature as much as possible in what is otherwise a very banal nondescript warehouse space. In type four, which are the COVID-19 lift pack and containerized surge field hospitals and quarantine units, this example from Taipei is a lift pack system, which was proposed a prototype and some of these were built. And this has been interesting because it responds to the heavy rainfall that they can receive there on a moment's no notice in that part of the world. 
and the HVA system is all housed above, and you can see all, or above or below. And um, it's completely lift pack system. So you look, I've been showing you examples of containerized as well as lift pack. This is a uh, lift pack system, which was proposed for, for Da Nang in Vietnam in a park. And it's, it's brought to the site on these uh, trailers and then assembled. This is a, um, a project in Delhi, India, which is uh, essentially an A-frame structure. And you can have one or you can have as many as um, five of these um, uh, that could all work off of a central, central structural core. And this shows how it's set up on, a, on an open field next to a hospital. And you examples from China. They built uh, two hospitals in a little bit more than 14 days time. And um, they, it was, th this received widespread international media attention, how the Chinese could do this so quickly. However, when analyzed from a biophilic and salutogenic standpoint, these, as well as many of the other examples I've shown you, are quite deficient. This is completely windowless, for instance, this hospital, 900 beds. This shows the site preparation and what it looked like while it was in construction. Here's a pro uh, project from Warsaw, which is uh, connected to an existing hospital. It's quite uh, elaborate. And the drawings that were posted online were, were um, almost a construction document quality. Here's a project from Italy, which was a combination of a container, a container and a pneumatic component. And these could be set up in long rows, either outdoors or indoors. This is a project proposed in the States, which looks a lot like a Nightingale Hospital. It has a, a central spine, and then the wings that uh, radiate to both sides. And there's open space in between the wings. And this is uh, all modular. It's a, well, it's a hybrid, it's modular. The basic room module is shown here in the lower left, but the roof is added on site. So I call this a hybrid. This is a project from Australia, which is very uh, minimalist, but very effective. It shows it installed in the, next to a hospital on the, in the parking lot. And it's, it's remarkably um, sophisticated considering that it's rapid deployment and construction. And then here are a few uh, projects from the design studio. This is called, um, this is a, a micro courtyard hospital, which is a hybrid as well because it's based upon a lift pack um, cellular structure for the modules, and it has the option to have a tent over overhead as a roof, and it's brought to the site, and these are what the shipping containers would look, look like. And the siting, the students were asked to site the projects on an existing hospital, four existing hospital campuses, one in Canada and three elsewhere in the world, and this is a medical center in Spain, and they were asked to develop a 50-bed deployment and a 100 bed deployment for rapid response, rapid construction. Here's another uh, project from the studio, which is using, uh, it's the same team that used the uh, work with the artist to create those, those polycarbonate panels in the pop-up clinic I showed you a few minutes ago. This is an inpatient um, surge hospital proposal which is modular, it comes to the site, the, uh, the modular is shown here. And then these are all connected as a series and at night. And they had 
What they did was they showed it cited here in the 50 bed configuration or the 100 bed configuration. And then this the tall, the tall side of the module is, um, is um, polycarbonate or it could be uh, plexiglass, which has these nature murals that are either impregnated into the panels or applied as a, as a film. And here it's prairie grasses in this iteration. And here's another where it's an abstracted forest scene. And so the students were asked to incorporate biophilia and salutogenic qualities as a reaction to the lack thereof in these ex global examples and many of them we, that we identify. Here's an example for the far north in Canada, uh, specifically it's called the Snow Crystal Hospital. This is the 100 bed deployment. It's modular, of course, it's a, it's a, um, a lift pack system with the central entrance. Some of these look like some of the, um, the utopian proposals from the 1960s of underwater hospitals or hospitals for space, lunar hospitals or whatever. And, but some of that thinking is appropriate in this case, especially in extreme climates such as in the Arctic. This shows, these are modules that uh, provide the support functions for staff in the, in the restrooms. And this is an open courtyard space at the center shown in green. And this is deployment. So I'll show, I think one more example here, which is, uh, this shows how it's brought, how it's shipped. There, there is this a containerized pop-up, pop-out hospital shown here. And this is the deployment next to a medical center in, um, I think it's in Ireland. And this, it says it's two levels. It has a lower level and upper le upper level where they're, they're um, crossed, in, you know, biaxial in the Part T. And this shows that all the componentry, what the part that's brought to the site as a module and then the other components that are plugged in after arrival on site. And they went, to great lengths to create large windows and to create mini courtyards, even so far as to put AstroTurf on the ground, assuming that this will be on a parking lot probably. And so this is a way at least to have some semblance of nature, even though it's abstracted. This is another view looking from one of the um, inpatient units out onto the courtyard. And then The, there's a discussion about these transportables are actually prosthetic devices. They share much in common with prosthetic devices worn by humans, such as artificial limbs. Both are built in a factory. Both are made of modular components and assembled in some sort of repetitive manufactured process. Both must be lightweight, malleable, and adaptable to change in the face of sudden and at times blunt force impact, such as in transit, and must be capable of returning resiliently to some approximation of their previous functional state prior to the disruption. So there are many similarities between the prosthetic device and a, a portable, transportable pop-up, modular, lift pack, or hybrid system, rapid response system. Now, is it feasible for this type of architecture to to express the Vitruvian triumvirate of commodity firmness and delight? Can this type of architecture provide more than minimal baseline physical support in a major emergency? And what if transportable healthcare facilities were routinely designed and built to incorporate baseline as well as salutogenic and biophilic that is truly therapeutic support in a time of crisis? So I would conclude by saying, that we architects need to do much better than what was done in the first year. We might have to do much better than repurposing this livestock arena in Texas into a drive-through pop-up facility or worse yet, into an inpatient treatment facility such as the example that Anne-Marie showed um, where 
which is quite medieval. It's not only goes back to Nightingale, but it goes back to the medieval plague hospitals where the, where the victims were just thrown into large open um, churches that were repurposed or open fields at the, in the center of a, of a courtyard of a church, courtyard church configuration. So I think that's all our end. I hope I've got, I haven't gone too far over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. So up next we have Celeste. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate being included in the panel. I almost forgot I was speaking because I took so many notes during the presentation um, of, of my colleagues here. And so I'm going to be speaking today about the psychology of architecture um, and the interplay between people and the built environment. So those who know me would uh, know it'd be remiss for me to introduce this concept without bringing up Blade Runner. Um, in the 1950s, um, author Philip K. Dick and Ridley Scott's uh, film adaptation that came later of the novel conceives of a bleak and desolate future of cities that have been in some way destroyed by humans as a solution they propose. Um, and I usually have the uh, intro uh, clip here, but they propose that um, off-world colonies offer citizens and inhabitants um, a, some promise and hope to uh, offer a chance to begin again in a golden land of opportunity and adventure. Well, in some ways, the pandemic offers a chance to begin again, a reset. The crisis has created an opportunity to collectively direct our efforts to optimize design for the human condition. Science fiction and reality aren't necessarily that far off, um, although perhaps that example was a bit extreme. And in this documentary that I'm sure everyone is aware of, The Human Scale, which features a lot of Jan Gale's work um, and, and really asks the question of, we're all humans. And so why aren't we building cities for people? And by cities, that includes the built environment broadly defined in terms of architecture, um, specific typologies of buildings, um, ur urban design in the public realm, neighborhoods, communities, et cetera. And so when you think about the fact that um, within, within a few decades that the population, for example, of Toronto alone is set to increase by an estimated 50%. And so in this example of the human scale, they offer insights from uh, conceptualizations of mega cities and show all kinds of examples from uh, interventions in the built environment that, that somehow um, have been solutions for, for people, but in some way took away all of the softness that we need. And so as we're shaping our city development, and especially as a function of um, some of the concepts that became more and more salient during the pandemic, um, how do we ensure that the defining features of our city, our city of neighborhoods and others like it, aren't lost in any attempt to address density, climate change, social determinants of health and well-being? And how do we foster that sense of connection and that softness that we all need? And so those are really important concepts that, that shape and define my work and my team's work. Um, when we look at some of our field or case studies, at the beginning of the pandemic, this is down the street from my loft at uh, Queen and Dover Court, and this was the first wave of the pandemic. And I, um, although was you know a little bit in denial, I'm thinking, okay, this will be a couple of weeks until people resolve what what the game plan will be. Um, it really became something that I saw in terms of pandemic life as a crisis of spirit. And so you saw these desolate streets. You were walking through these ghost uh, cities and in, in neighborhoods and, and the very fabric of our neighborhoods that made them so vital, having spontaneous interactions with neighbors, seeing some kinds of sign of life um, really started to take a toll on us. What's really interesting oops, is that we're humans. And so I'm showing you a couple of examples of some of the formal interventions that happened. Here is an example um, that also Anne-Marie showed. This one is um, sort of how 
we started to build these grids or circles within public space because we saw people were flocking to um, to parks, any outdoor space they could find. Um, we also see here, um, the next image is Cafe TO here in Toronto, which was in reaction to how do we you know, not lose our vibrant restaurants and cafe and street life. And we created um, more of kind of a street presence, similar to what you would find in Europe, similar to what we might have in the summer. Um, but we took some of our, um, our vehicular traffic and, and prevented it from kind of flowing here and, and opted instead to create these outdoor cafes and patios. We saw a lot of informal things happening as well in terms of how people use their outdoor space, um, how people connected with um, neighbors. I happen to live in a very neo-Bohemian neighborhood. Um, our neighbors became in some ways a, a bubble in terms of our own outdoor public spaces um, and areas within the community. And you became to rely on them a little bit more. And so you saw this happening informally as well as formally. Um, and we started to shape shift a little bit. And those of us, you know, not everyone has family. Uh, not everyone has what a typical, for example, 1950s family and, and beyond um, would look like. And in fact, demographics are changing. And so we also saw a little bit of a revolt to that, um, you know, what is a family bubble, so to speak, and how do you actually create these opportunities to engage socially? We were seeking that out um, due to our increased isolation um, and lack of ability to interact with others. And so what we know about humans and the human condition is that we're social animals, we're social beings, um, and well-being is really important to us. And how you define that is, um, is beyond health outcomes. It has to do a lot with our social connections to others. It has to do in terms of our happiness, um, our outlook on life, our social relationships, our physical health our interaction with the community and in fact with the built environment. The World Health Organization, for example, includes that built environment and social determinants of health and well-being definitions. And so it's important to consider that. Um, so all this to say that the pandemic heightened the need for um, or increase the salience of the concept of well-being and the needs of people and creating things at the human scale. And so I wanted to highlight case study one as, as an exemplar, um, and many on the panel for sure know it, and, and I'm assuming some that um, are in the audience have been familiar with it, but this was an exemplar of Bridgepoint Active Healthcare um, that was designed, in fact, to, um, to highlight that connection to others, to provide opportunities um, for optimizing well-being and creating oppor opportunities to connect to nature, to the city, to almost um, create opportunities to re-engage in life. And so it became a, a new way, in this case, to design a hospital. But the exemplar becomes important in a number of ways. It starts to refocus our thinking about capital infrastructure investments, public inf infra infrastructure investments, private, et cetera, and how you can actually look at these collaborations and bring forward a greater focus on um, how well-being is defined in the spirit of uh, design interventions, the built environment, specific buildings, whether it's hospitals um, or uh, public realm, et cetera. And so this project, I won't go through all of the details. I'll uh, instruct you to have a look at our Methologica website where we showcase a lot of the projects. But it became an exemplar in a lot of ways. One, this sort of emphasis on well-being, um, the architectural design team, um, PDC team of Diamond Schmidt and HDR, and um, the DBFM team, or sorry, um, opposite. It was the PDC team of Stantec and KPMB and Joint Venture, and um, the design, build, finance, maintain, Diamond Schmidt and HDR. Um, we had an uh, interdisciplinary team in collaboration and developed methodological lab obtained a number of research grants, including one major CIHR research funding that led to the commercialization of an academic project into Methologica. And so that was a novel concept. Um, it also was our way where we partnered with so many of our collabor collaborators, including colleagues at Ryerson and, and elsewhere, um, and had a, a massive uh, influx of research interns and we developed a new approach to user engagement, to user experience and design evaluation, um, and began to uh, use methods of social research and evaluation and apply them to the context of the built environment to inform design, but also to evaluate its impact on users and well-being and outcomes. Um, it started to 
create an opportunity to understand how we can start to quantify and measure those more, more intangible or fuzzy concepts and um, bring them to light. Concepts like hope and well-being that we're now seeing are extremely important um, in terms of the built environment. Beyond Bridgepoint, it led to several um, other projects, including um, our work in other hospital designs, but also in other projects such as hospitality, the public realm, uh, and beyond. And so I wanted to kind of highlight that example and how it's leading to the development of this or how it's informing some of the ideas around a project that has already existed or is in development. It's a proposal for University Park and, and, um, and, and it's, it's something that is happening um, with another group. I was invited on uh, a project through my involvement with uh, Sick Kids Redevelopment, but this is a proposal that's forwarded by Public Work, Urban Strategies, um, involvement with the Michael Young Family Foundation and Evergreen. And the idea of University Park and, and these distinct but unified public realm zones and how, in fact, you can create these opportunities to redefine and conceptualize wellness all the way from the waterfront up to Queen's Park. And so where my involvement came into play um, was really around the wellness district because of the involvement of uh, redevelopment projects at Sick Kids, as well as UHN and Mount Sinai. And so looking at how you can actually use some of the concepts around concept mapping of wellness, biophilic design that's more than nature, it includes the people, how you create these opportunities for social connection and expand the public realm. And so it was interesting that what we did was, um, in addition to, to my involvement on a, on a workshop, um, there was an interesting opportunity where um, we decided to use this as an and as, a, as an exemplar or a case study for a course I was teaching, it was a master's um, architecture elective at Ryerson uh, University X. And my class actually um, was tasked with the idea of going out and creating some type of a design intervention for, um, for this area. And it could be any part of the wellness district or the broader University uh, Avenue or University Park context. And so I wanted to showcase um, the work. I can't due to time showcase everyone's work um, or some of the broader ideas, but I will take one example. And I want to credit the students um, that are listed here, Julianne Guevara, Kavita Garg, Nicola Casabella, and Sarah Schwab. And what we did was we applied one of our methodologies. So Methodologica and, and our team have, um, we use a lot of the methodological approaches in uh, socio-behavioral research. One of them and the most fundamental one being observational studies or naturalistic observation. And so we went out on a walkabout around University Park and the adjacent areas and all the pathways in between these interconnected sites that link sick kids to um, to UHN more broadly and to Mount Sinai and kind of the broader community all the way to Queens Park. And they were tasked with finding a location that they wanted to develop a design intervention. But what they had to do was observe activities, patterns of behavior, and concepts of well being and how you could introduce concepts of well being into these spaces. This team I found interesting because they chose this wall. Um, it's very small to see, but there's this tiny image up here of Elm Street and these spaces in between. And it's a very hard um, streetscape and it serves as a corridor. Um, and what, what the students did, they went out and they observed at different times. They saw people reading, taking phone calls. Um, they saw healthcare workers, construction workers, uh, folding chairs. People brought their own devices to sit on um, in terms of how they crossed the street, navigated traffic, sitting in the shade, or finding all kinds of opportunities um, to gather in smaller groups or just take a break. And often it was healthcare workers that were taking a break or visitors at one of the healthcare facilities. And so what was interesting was that they used these observational studies and they created this sort of design concept moving forward. But in this case, the students came up with this definition for well-being that captured how public spaces could respond to not only the various demographics and community, but to try and induce the sense of calm um, in an area that is a very active corridor within the urban fabric. And so I found it really interesting that they took this wallscape almost by, by this building and they created these unique, almost utopian areas around a market, around the playground, a loungescape, a water wall, 
flexible seating um, in terms of how the users and how the demographics of in not only sick kids, but the adjacent community and how it might link in or feed into the university park um, to promote and foster well being, in this case by calmness, but by providing opportunities to gather socially at a market. Um, opportunities to play different typologies of users, they came up with scenarios and how different users would interact with this space. Um, and then this idea of a noise barrier as a water wall and um, having flexible seating based on patterns of behavior. All of this to say, this was one example of one methodological approach, including naturalistic observation and how it could be integrated into the design process. Had we been able to move forward as a class, we would have been able to, you know, if we had longer time in a perhaps a full studio, uh, we might have been able or being part of a, a larger redevelopment, we may have been able to carry this forward in terms of actually um, surveying the users, taking them on what we call our moving interviews. Um, also, then doing some baseline data at the existing sites and capturing this after the fact. And so this was really one idea of how you can start to begin to shape the um, evidence base in, in social psychology and environmental psychology and architecture, begin to integrate that into the design teams to not only capture the user experience, observe it, document it, and use that as a template to inform design. So that was one example um, that I wanted to highlight that I thought would be uh, valuable to show how it could be scalable from something very small to a much larger project um, carrying forward to design conceptualization all the way to evaluation and in between at baseline post occupancy, etc. So I just wanted to share those examples with you. Um, going back to an opportunity and a chance to begin again, not only in this project, but through the pandemic where the idea of what we need as humans to thrive, um, is there a chance to begin again in terms of how we start to inform architectural design and interventions, um, not only by optimizing the public realm or enhancing programming related to concepts of wellness, the idea of extending our design intentions um, beyond one specific facility alone, or almost using that just as the proposed university park along with the separate redevelopment projects of Sick Kids, uh, UHN and Mount Sinai are starting to perhaps think about how each of their facilities could contribute to that broader public realm beyond that site specific aspect. Um, it's a chance really to be disruptive in a way, to redefine, to rebrand and revitalize engage users, um, talk to the people. Uh, I think that we noticed um, patterns of behavior and fundamental principles of psychology and behavior and, um, and what people actually need. And that's really important as a driver for um, applying that research to inform design, um, really with the end goal to optimize the human condition and built environment and, and the city by design. Um, the one that we have, I don't think we're going to off world colonies anytime soon. I'll leave it there. I, I won't go into all of our outputs, um, but I'll uh, introduce this as our website. Feel free to have a look. We have projects that um, need to be updated, our field guides and measures that are licensable, and our upcoming certificate program and workshops. So I thank you. Thank you so much, Celeste. So up next, we have Beatrice with her presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, event and congratulations to the first year Master of Architecture class and, and particularly to Janet and, and Jasmine. I really I, I'm a great believer in uh, students organize events uh, to the point that, uh, you know, I, I, I always have a, a soft spot for these kinds of things. And even in when they come in, you know, I have to turn down a lot of events, obviously. But then, you know, when they are organized, I really believe in the pedagogical value of these uh, things. And I congratulate you in a very well organized uh, um, um, panel. And, and uh, I think you learn a lot from this. I also work a lot with uh, my own students, in particularly in this question of uh, pandemics. I had been working for a lo very long time, uh, way before the pandemic, believe it or not, I was teaching a class in Princeton for the PhD students, a, a kind of pro-seminar to introduce to, to methods in architecture on the question of architecture in the age of, um, of pandemics. And, and part of what uh, I'm going to, to um, be presenting is part of this, uh, and now where did my uh, 
Sorry about this. Uh, where did my presentation go? Here it is. Okay. Um, I go back here. And I try to share the screen because when I tried to share the screen before, it wasn't there. <laughs> okay, here. Uh, gosh, why is this covering what I need to see? Start from the beginning. You see well? Yep. You see well. Okay, fantastic. So, um, as I was saying, I, I have been teaching uh, uh, these questions about illness and architecture, which, by the way, has been my obsession for all my life. I mean, it's been um, uh, really the very beginning of, of my thinking in architecture. It's been about the question of uh, illness. I wanted this to be in my dissertation, as I explained in the introduction to my book, X-ray Architecture, but somehow Nobody in architecture thought that that was a good topic, so I ended up working on something else, on <laughs> laws and Le Corbusier and media and these things that ended up in, in, an, in the book Privacy and Publicity. And it was only much later uh, that I managed the, the courage to return to these questions and to recover all these little articles that I have published on the site um, uh, for over 20 years into this uh, latest book, X-ray Architecture. Uh, which is about the impact, of course, of tuberculosis on modern architecture. So I want to take a look, and then of course COVID happened, and with COVID, a lot of, uh, <laughs> and the publication of the book being in 2019, I was kind of uh, bombarded with requests from all over the world to think about uh, what uh, uh, COVID meant for, for architecture, which has been a very interesting uh, uh, question uh, for me. So, uh, in principle, I wanted to start uh, a little bit by going back uh, uh, historically also to think about the question of how we have always understood architecture in terms of a body. But if you think about it, it's usually this kind of macho body, this athletic, white, of course, male uh, body that is endlessly redrawn over the centuries from, let's say, Leonardo uh, to Le Corbusier. So it's a perfected body inserted in some kind of geometric uh, system of, of proportion. And yet the point of, of what I'm going to, to present uh, and the point of my research is that the real body of architecture is not at all a healthy body, but a fragile body prone to disease or already sick and in need of support. And that actually architecture is a kind of orthopedic support, a kind of uh, crutch or, or an artificial skin precisely for this fragile, fragile creature. So architectural discourse from, from the very beginning, uh, as I would try to point very quickly, is medical. And the architect is always presented as a kind of doctor uh, and buildings, buildings, believe it or not, as a, as a medical uh, uh, devices, as medical instruments. And uh, because uh, the question of COVID is uh, pressing so much on, on us, I want to start by uh, thinking about these images that were common that became uh, very shocking in the media in the early uh, days of the pandemic. This is a grid of empty beds in, in Madrid, actually the place where I was born, uh, in this cavernous uh, space in which you have a hospital, a field hospital that was established between days to accommodate 5,500 patients in, in what used to be a convention, well, it is still a convention center hall in Madrid. So a building that was designed for temporary um, events was now hosting an emergency architecture. And we also images of this kind all over uh, the world. It was not just Madrid, but uh, Belgrade uh, here or New York, the Javits Center and many others that you can think about it. But also perhaps uh, think about the fact that it's also not the first time in history that this has happened. As we can see, for example, in the, again, the Javits Center, uh, the photographs from the 1918 uh, flu pandemic in the United States, where you could see thousands of, of beds in, again, um, in these cavernous uh, uh, spaces. So we tend to forget very quickly what happens historically, but this is not so far uh, uh, away. But sick architecture is not uh, simply the architecture of medical emergencies. On the contrary, it could be argued that um, that is the architecture of normality. Uh, the way in which past uh, health crises are somehow is inscribed into the everyday with each architecture not carrying just the traces of prior diseases, but having been completely, as we will see, saved by these crises. So, 
In fact, we can argue, as this fellow did, um, <laughs> that all architecture is sick, that illness and architecture uh, going further, you can say, are inseparable. At the beginning of uh, uh, the beginning of architecture, at the beginning of the seas, as this uh, guy, Dr. Benjamin Ward uh, Richardson, already um, put it in the introduction to this uh, volume, or homes and how to make them make them healthy, which was a compendium of tests that was put together by architects and doctors. Believe it or not, for a long time, there was this very strong collaboration between doctors and, and architects. For then, 1884. International Health Exhibition in London that Anna Marie, Anna Marie already um, uh, talked about before. So here is the plan and the guide to the health exhibition and some of the illustrations and the equipment that was being introduced, like the water closet, etc. But I go straight to what uh, this fellow say in his uh, introduction to the volume, and I go straight to the last line where he says, man in constructing protection from exposure has constructed the conditions of the seas. And this is amazing because, in fact, it, it can be demonstrated historically that there is no disease without architecture and no architecture without disease. In fact, I mean, if you go back historically, now they have demonstrated that tuberculosis existed in the Neolithic. So as, as soon as we went <laughs> indoors, as soon as we developed an architecture that was not living in caves or in, in, in baskets, um, uh, we developed the diseases that are part of our of our of our time. So there is in, in that sense no disease without architecture, no architecture without disease. And doctors and architects have been always in that kind of dance, uh, often uh, exchanging roles, collaborating, even if not always uh, synchronized. And furniture, uh, rooms, buildings, cities, etc., are produced by medical emergencies, as, as I say before, layer on top of one another over the centuries. And what is remarkable is that we tend to forget very quickly um, what causes these layers. We always act as each pandemic, each, uh, each, each emergency is the, is the first. So we act as, you know, we develop all collective amnesia. It's very extraordinary. Um, for example, we were all shocked when we were asked to put masks, but look at these uh, uh, voluntaries in the uh, 1918, uh, flu in uh, in Boston um, uh, uh, wearing masks very similar to the ones um, that we are wearing today. And yet it could be argued, as I was saying before, that the history of the city is the history of the seas. I mean, it would be a very interesting history that we could write, the history <laughs> of the cities only from the point of view of the seas, and it would be possible. And I think about how the pandemics of the 19th century brought uh, to us infrastructure that we now take for granted, like clean water or sewage uh, systems or urban parks, etc. cetera. Uh, this is, for example, the construction of the embankment in, in London in 1862, incorporating the whole sewage uh, system. And this was in response, of course, to the greatest thing of, in London of 1858. So in response to, to these epidemics of uh, cholera, and when it was finally understood that it was not the miasma that was provoking <laughs> the disease, but it was the contaminated water, uh, that we uh, put in place the infrastructure that was, uh, that was needed. So uh, even, even going back uh, farther uh, historically, well, you can also say that they not only revolutionized our cities, but also uh, the furniture and the interior design of buildings. So in this catalog that uh, that I was quoting, they are not only illustrations of how uh, to arrange the uh, or to include um, uh, equipment in the house, but also how to have a hygienic uh, uh, interior. But as I say, uh, the relationship between architecture and health is a very, very old story that goes to the very beginning of architecture theory. So you have Vitruvius in the first uh, century BC that he was supposed to be launching the first one to launch Western architecture uh, theory, precisely insist on the idea that the architect, that all architects should study also medicine. Okay, I see we didn't have enough to study in architecture, right? It's not hard enough, like now we have to study medicine. Why? Why? Because healthfulness is the most uh, important um, uh, objective of the architect. And in his 10 books of, of architecture, he talks a lot about the question of health, even giving detailed instructions of where you should place a city, 
returning to the old practice of sacrificing an animal and inspecting the liver to make sure that the liver is sound and firm. And if it's sound and firm, then we can have a city there. But likewise, he discusses the health of buildings and the, in terms of the theory of the four humors and the theory of the four humors was the medical dominant medical theory of the uh, time. And even more interesting, Vitruvius uh, argues that those who are sick, those who are unwell, can be cured by architecture. And that is a very interesting thing because at that point he talks about including those exhausted by disease, including consumption. And consumption is precisely an old word, word for tuberculosis. So already in Vitruvius, you have the idea that with architecture, you can cure uh, what we now call um, uh, tuberculosis. In the Renaissance, uh, for example, the first schools of architecture were established, including the Academia del Diseño, the first one in Florence in 1563, founded by Vasari. Well, I suppose they could have placed themselves anywhere in Florence, but no, they placed themselves exactly next to the medical school because, of course, they had a lot to, in common. And the students of architecture, the students of design, were required to attend the dissection in the local hospital, Santa Maria Nova. Uh, and draw this body that was decomposing uh, for days on end, even if they were getting sick, even if the body was putrefying, if they were complaints. Uh, now they have to keep there at, at it. Um, to make the story so short, every subsequent architectural theory through the centuries added, added something to this medical paradigm. So cities, in a way, represent an accumulated uh, uh, or a kind of accumulation of theories of disease from ancient times to the present. One can even argue further that the CIS is the real designer of it. Modern architecture, without going further, and modern architecture is what most interests me and, and the subject of my uh, book on, on X-ray architecture, was actually produced, and nobody thinks about that, under very um, uh, dire conditions, under emergency uh, conditions throughout the 19th uh, century and the first half of the 20th century, millions were uh, dying of tuberculosis every year and all over uh, the world. And modern buildings were precisely presented as offering some prophylactic uh, defense against this invisible uh, microorganism. So all the defining uh, features of modern architecture, white walls, um, uh, terraces, uh, big windows, detachment from the ground, etc. And these are all illustrations from, from my book were presented as form of prevention and cure. So how do we do that? How do you convince uh, people that this architecture, you can see on the right, the building of the Corbusier, was uh, desirable? I mean, the probability that generation of this is crazy, right? It doesn't look anything like the houses they were living before. Well, first they had to demonize uh, 19th century architecture no, not as I don't like it, or not as it's uh, uh, not my style, but as being unhealthy. That's why how they were able to communicate to a large number of people all over the world. No? So 19th century architecture was all, all of a sudden demonized as unhealthy, as nervous, and literally filled with disease, especially the bacillus of uh, tuberculosis. And the creation uh, was treated as an infection. So modernizing architecture was first and foremost a form of disinfe disinfection, a purification of buildings, leading to a health uh, uh, given environment of light, air, cleanliness, uh, et cetera. It's interesting, for example, in this poster of the Seed Lund uh, in Stuttgart that you probably know, Mies, Gropius, all of them, uh, variants, all of them had uh, houses uh, there. The poster is not uh, what we are going to do in the future. The poster is a cross of what we are going to eliminate, which is precisely is this 19th century interior full of uh, knickknacks and, and, and full of, of um, places where the seas uh, hides, right? Um, so, uh, so in order to, to, to do this, and then our modernizing architecture was precisely uh, producing this health environment of light, air, cleanliness, uh, and smooth white surfaces without cracks or crevices where contagion may lurk. And women were even advised, and this is very funny, to leave petri, petri dishes in their living room to see if they have, they are cleaning, uh, uh, has survived 
um, uh, the bacteria had survived their cleaning routine. So it was not so sufficient that it looks clean. You have to demonstrate that you are clean. And, and so uh, uh, the housewife, in that sense, becomes like a bacteriologist. And the house is like her laboratory, which is totally responsible for the health of the family. If anybody gets sick, it's the fault of the, of the housewife, right? Um, so uh, let me just go very briefly on to Alvar Alto and I know Alto that the scientist by Inyo, a uh, beautiful sanatorium in uh, 1929 in uh, Finland with very clean, again, very clean and it looks to you like, probably like a normal uh, kind of uh, uh, modern uh, room, but it's a hospital uh, room first that is designed exactly to minimize uh, uh, dust, uh, to, so to minimize surfaces where dust will accumulate. So even the intersection of the floor and the and the and the wall beneath the window, as you can see in this drawing, is curved. So to stop uh, the buildup of of dust, and and the architects also design all this uh, furniture and fittings, uh, including the chairs. The back of these pioneer chairs was designed to allow expectoration and opening the, the chest. And, and the spittons and the and all these uh, um, sinks were designed uh, by the architects, including these uh, door handles that were designed not to cut the sleeves of the door, those uh, white coats. So everything is designed to the. But the building's main equipment is this terrace uh, uh, where the patients were wheeled out to take the uh, famous cure, the doses of fresh air and sun in this specially designed uh, chairs by Aino Alto, beautiful uh, chairs. And here you have Aino Alto lying on the chairs uh, and that she had designed for Paimio, which I think is very interesting because it's not, again, not the heroic male uh, macho architect in front of the building, but the, again, uh, the weak uh, uh, body, the architect presenting herself as a sick uh, uh, person lying in the terrace of Paimio. Now, uh, I argue that modern uh, ar that tuberculosis made modern architecture modern. So it's not at all that modern architects simply did modern sanatory. That would be too simple, right? That would be too easy. It's, it's the opposite. Alto actually is a very good example because he was a perfectly uh, neoclassic architect before he entered the competition uh, for this sanatorium in Kinkoma in Finland, a competition that he didn't won. But he says it was his conversion. He talks about it as it was a religious conversion, conversion to functionalism, conversion to modern architecture. But you can see, even if he didn't win the project, that the project in many ways uh, anticipates uh, uh, Paini. For, for uh, Alto, the sanatorium was not architecture in the service of medicine, but a form of medicine uh, itself. He says the main purpose of the building is to function as a medical instrument. So he understands the building as medicine, right? The room, he says, is designed uh, uh, for the depleted strength uh, of the patient reclining in his bed. So here is uh, the fundamental, the client uh, lying on this bed. It's very important to understand that Aldo had been very sick at the time of the commission of the project and claimed that having to be in bed for such an extended period of time had been crucial to his understanding of the problem. And then he says something super interesting that you will appreciate. He says, architecture is always conceived for the vertical person. But here you have a client that is permanently on the horizontal. So you have these beautiful drawings of Alto that describe this. And of course, the whole design of the room has to change if the patient, if the client is on the horizontal. You cannot have, uh, you know, light fixtures on the ceiling irritating the eyes of the, of the person lying on the bed. And you have to calculate the views from the bed to the forest, for example, in the terrace, you see this very low parapet and this very thin bay that allowed the patients lying on these chairs for long periods of time to see uh, 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 the landscape. He also talks about the colors of the room and of the building that were supposed to be um, dark blues uh, for the room and, and the walls in lighter shades. And he talks about the bright canary yellow in the reception booth by the entrance and in the linoleum of the lobby to evoke, he says, sunny optimism, even in cold and cloudy days. So um, he then talks about how psychological factors are also to be very carefully considered. 
An extended period of confinement, he says, can be extremely depressing for a bed ridden uh, patient. Uh, you bet it is, right? Then he says, a tuberculosis sanatorium is to all intents and purposes a house with open windows. Okay, that's almost normal, right? You want to make the hospital hospitable and you make it more like a house. But for me, the amazing thing is when I keep reading and I see he reverses it. And he says, if the hospital has to be thought as a new kind of house, he says in reverse, the generic house needs to be like a sanatorium, right? So that, now we have uh, really the beginning of modern, of understanding modern architecture, the house as sanatorium. I was able to discover, he says, that the special physical and psychological reactions by patients provide good pointers uh, for ordinary uh, housing, housing. So the bodily and psychological sensitivity of the sick person is used to recalibrate the uh, architecture. Even the specialized uh, furniture, like the Paimio uh, chair, that, as I said before, was designed to open the chest of the patients, allowing them to breathe easier, soon became everybody's chair, right? And the same with the rest of the furniture of Paimio. So at the time, uh, they wrote, uh, uh, Alto Anaino, uh, Alvar Alto Anaino Alto wrote, the sanatorium and its furniture, which should be light, flexible, easy to clean, etc. And after extensive uh, experimentation, we came up with the flexible system of, the, of this uh, uh, plywood chairs, they say, to produce furniture that was more suitable for the long and painful life in a sanatorium. Okay, so very good. They established a workshop next to the sanatorium and they produce all the furniture for the, for the hospital. That's fine. But between two, two years, then Artec opened and Artec is selling exactly the same furniture for everybody. And then the, the publicity of our tech says the ambition is to support and nourish human beings' physical and psychological well-being. So again, the same thing, right? The furniture that was for the sick is now for everyone. So the reference point for, for the altos is obviously the seriously ill. Alto even claimed that the architect, and this I think that's fascinating idea, always should design for the person in the weakest position. I mean, you think about that now with all the interest that we have right now on architecture and disabilities, uh, finally, right? Uh, and, and, and you have here like the road not taken because if everybody was designing for the, if the architect was designing for the person in the weakest uh, position, everybody else will take care, right, of themselves, right? And, and, and you have to think about it that we are all in a weak position at many points in our lives because we are babies, because we are old, because we are sick, because we are pregnant because we have cancer, because we have whatever, right? So this idea of the healthy athletic body <laughs> of modern architecture exists for a very short period of, of, of time and for, um, only for a segment of the, of the population. So it's very interesting that in the alto sickness is not seen at all as an exception, but as the norm. And of course, varying degrees of sickness define the human condition, the modern subject has many um, ailments, uh, psychological and, and physical, and architecture, as I said before, is, an art, is a protective cocoon, not just against the weather and other outside threats, but in modernity, more notably about internal threats, whether are psychological or, or bodily ailments. I'm not so sure how we are doing this time, but I could also finish here or take two minutes to complete. Okay. Go ahead and conclude, yes. So Alto compared his experiments in Paino, and I thought that that was fascinating, and their application to everyday use to the exaggerated forms of analysis that scientists use in order to obtain more clearly and more visible results, such as sustained bacteria for microsco microscopic examination. So that's what he considers uh, architecture. He sees design as a form of medical research, and the sanatorium I think as a kind of research lab for modern architecture. So this relationship between architecture and the human body is very intimate. With modern architecture, this intimacy deepens uh, the body and now includes these invisible microbes. And that's why I talk about the bacterial clients of modern architecture, because I think the real clients of modern architecture are invisible. If you think about it, Sigmund Freud, uh, the X-ray uh, bacteriology and the germ theory of the disease are all uh, emerging in the same very short, same short period of time. And they are all about uh, uh, 
uh, looking inside, acknowledging the invisible, whether it can confuse with Freud, the skeleton in the X-ray, the micro element of the bacteria, the bacillus of tuberculosis. And architecture turns itself inside out too. The thread is no longer outside in the elements, for example, but the, in the invisible, in the micro scale of the bacteria that became the base of furniture, such as this one, houses and cities. So there's the micro and the micro, the bacterium and the city. Cities were suddenly uh, seen full of uh, uh, these unseen occupants that in a sense became the new clients of modern architecture and design. And the architect, uh, himself becomes a bacteriologist. Here you have, for example, Le Corbusier, he, who in, in Precision, a very well-known book, but nobody pays attention to this strange passage of Le Corbusier, where he says, for example, that, uh, that the architect needs laboratory work, isolating his micro, his micro, uh, until it appears in indisputable clarity. These are his words, right? Then he goes on to say that, that with this, one can make a diagnosis and draw up the fundamental principles of modern city planning. So architecture uh, in the Corbusier goes from micro to city and back, right? So uh, I'll leave it with, with you, but the conclusion will be that the weak body uh, of architecture is not just the paradigm of seeing architecture from the point of view of those in the weakest position, as Alto uh, says, the horizontal kind of a uh, of of his world, but seeing the human species itself as weak, as fragile, as vulnerable, and immersed in bacteria. And, and the human is no longer the center of this geometric system, it never was. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it, I think we have to think about of sickness not in a negative term, but precisely as a generator of new potentials and the very engine of, uh, of modernity and of a new architecture, I suppose, after COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Beatrice. So now we're going to move into the panel discussion session, which will be hosted by our moderator, Lisa. Um, so Anne-Marie, Stefan, Celeste, uh, Beatrice, feel free to ask each other questions as well during the session. Um, so I'll leave it to you, Lisa. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jeanette. And thank you, Jasmine, as well. And to all of the students at Ryerson University in the master's program who I know have a hand in putting this endeavor together. Actually, the last time, uh, one of the last events that I was at in person uh, was in February of 2020 at the Ryerson Symposium that year, where we were crowded around tables together at the Sidewalk Labs uh, downtown, which is now no more. But we are crowded so closely together, having exchanges across tables, and the students I know did a lot of work for that. So I bet there are a lot more than the two of you who had a hand in this, and as well the institution who is supporting you. Just, so thank you to the whole circle. And so I am speaking to you from Winnipeg, from the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Meti Nation. And I know that. I and collectively we have the fun task of pulling the fragments together uh, from the conversations but also from the geography because we are spread out. I'm in Winnipeg, uh, Anne-Marie is in Montreal, Celeste and Stephen are in Toronto and Beatrice I believe you are in New York. Mm -hmm. um, so we are pulling the pieces together and attempting to address the very interesting question which is on the student's mind which is about how does this change things? I think in a, as a master's program, you've already have some, some studies under your belt. You're getting ready to, to unleash your talents for the world. And you're wondering about how all of this is changing. And certainly your pedagogical situation has changed. But I would like to get things going. And I'll also say that I know there's a question, a Q&A box. And I see that there are three short questions in there. And I will come back to them. But I'm going to open up with a topic that each of the panelists can address and that the topic is we've already addressed it in part but the topic is about health health and how this particular pandemic uh, is changing our understanding of health and what constitutes health and I'll just flash you know one of my favorite books because it has a great title The Enigma of Health by Hans Georg Gadamer it's a wonderful title for a book mm -hmm. and the enigma you know, health is maybe always been a bit elusive that 
it's been difficult to pinpoint. And in fact, enigma itself includes in it an old Greek word for fable. You know, it's something that we might need to, we can approach it only through stories or only through metaphors or only through uh, other strategies, oblique strategies. But you've all given particular ways to approach the concept of health what constitutes health? Beatrice, you've reminded us that the that health has something is something that has really belonged to the discipline from the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephen, you've given us a, a range of case studies uh, where the health industry, together with architects, have proposed quick solutions to address how to deliver health, how to deliver cures, how to measure health rapidly in this particular situation. Celeste, you've reminded us about the importance of well-being and mental health, and certainly this pandemic has, has renewed attention on that. And Anne-Marie, you've brought us back into the, into the home in part in domestic well-being, but at the same time pointed out that, you know, the sick room has always been part of that home um, and Beatrice that that sickness is not something outside of art disease is part of architecture so mm -hmm. maybe we can go back and maybe we could go uh, backward in this in the sequence unless someone else would like to begin to address the question of how has the situation changed our understanding of health uh, for architects Beatrice would you like to begin I just seen it, but I think it's a, it's a very very important uh, question. I will again take the long uh, the long uh, view. I think it's uh, it's very important because uh, otherwise we become obsessed with this particular pandemic. As we have always been in kind of a situation of one crisis or another. The whole history of architecture you can uh, relate to, to uh, uh, a very important. Uh, 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 health situation. I mean, we think about uh, Hausmann in terms of uh, the order of the city, and it has always been described in terms of uh, like trying to repress. Uh, um, uh, but that, that didn't work out very well. If that's the case, we could look at 1968. We have the Hausmann, and you know, there were all these riots in the city. But what nobody talks about is Hausmann was a health nut. He had he was full of he was obsessed with he is full of manuals, and 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 most of the things that he put everything that he put in place have to do with preventing precisely uh, pandemics in, in, in Paris during, during that time. The same with the plan Cerda, the extension of, uh, of Barcelona, this, this fantastic grid, and it underlying almost every um, intervention is a question of health. So what does COVID add to this, uh, to this uh, uh, thing? I really appreciate very much how uh, architects jump immediately into, into the thing. They, of course, it's our business to provide solutions, right? But we have always to take the longer, the longer uh, uh, view. So uh, a lot of the questions by journalists and, 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 uh, and, and architectural magazines and design magazines uh, that basically, um, ask you to speculate about what the city of the future or the architecture of the future uh, will be, uh, tended to focus very much, of course, I mean, it's, 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 it's the problem of the architect, on the visible uh, city, right? And offering all these little kind of, a lot of plexiglass, right? A lot of uh, ways in which they buy the spaces and a lot of, and some of the things are, are very valid, but I what I was most struck by this uh, pandemic is, uh, uh, a more shock is, is the way in which made visible precisely the invisible, the invisible uh, city, and I mean just not the invisible urbanism of this hyper uh, social microorganism that were our enemy, but the invisible uh, urbanism of inequities, of hidden workers, and even um, uh, uneven access uh, to care and, and even to, to empathy, right? So uh, uh, the shocking situation of, oh yeah, we have to be all at home, come on. We were all at home, that was the situation of privilege. I mean, I was in New York during the uh, worst, uh, absolutely worst of the pandemic. I, was, I live here, so here I was, right? In, in um, 
in March of, of 2020. And of course, we were all confined at home, but it was not all. I mean, look at all uh, uh, the poor people that have to get up at four o'clock in the morning and go and clean a hospital of all things, survive the metro, the subway, which was extremely frightening, completely medieval, what was happening <laughs> there, and, and live in this in these conditions. So you realize also the enormous amount of people that are, I'm sure it's different in, in Canada, but in uh, uh, the United States, you, you realize the unbelievable inequities in terms of uh, the hospitals in Queens versus the hospitals in Manhattan, the hospitals in Harlem. I mean, it was obvious to all of us uh, uh, that what this was really um, making visible is the invisible city that was always there. It was there before the pandemic, but we have kind of developed ways of ignoring it. And now it was not possible to ignore it, right? So um, uh, from there to Black Lives Matter uh, 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 in June of the same year, again, uh, in New York and the protests, I mean, I think it's a very clear uh, sense that uh, that uh, that we walk up to another uh, to another to, to another uh, reality, which is the same reality that we have. So pandemics, actually, by the way, historically always make evident what was already there. All the prejudices that were there. So the Jews were blamed on this pandemic. They whatever everybody you have to blame someone, and there has always some been uh, occasions for for discrimination, for uh, revenge, for and in this case, the pandemic made obvious what was already there, which is the unbelievable inequalities uh, in the United States, at least, which is what I, I was. Yeah, the endangered health of the civil rights. And, and it was actually wonderful how the fear of the pandemic was transcended by the desire to participate in, in those important demonstrations. Um, Stephen, maybe we could go to you next on the question of the health definition, because you were, your examples focus most directly on the health industry. And how has this changed our approach to health as architects, designers? Well, I think that um, we have we have a classical definition of what a, a therapeutic environment is and what a counter therapeutic environment is. And I think that those definitions have been inverted and completely turned upside down in the pandemic. And in other words, as Anne-Marie discussed, the home has become an environment that becomes uh, appraised, reappraised in a time like this for its a degree of therapeutic support. And if it does not provide this, it's, I, by default, it's considered counter therapeutic, i.e. it's too small, there's no adjacent outdoor space. And the things that you relied upon before in the home environment no longer work because of overcrowdedness and the lack of connection with nature and the sense of confinement. Um, and so it's resulted, it's manifest in many things, people wanting to get larger living spaces and there's been a large movement for people to, because they've outgrown, as soon as they, they become more aware consciously of the therapeutic function of the built environment around them in their immediate life, they begin to reappraise it and they want more because they realize what they had will not work any longer in this environment. And I think this is going to stick. I don't think this aspect is going to go away after the pandemic is over. Um, so then, by extension, a lot of architects, they would have shunned the area of healthcare architecture maybe in the past. And this is a bias that begins in the schools because it's a topic which is given, uh, it's dismissed. And, and if it's um, addressed in a curriculum, it's only a one-time project and it's not a sustainable effort to introduce the student to the ideas of health and the importance of the built environment in terms of sustaining health, because health is all around us as we see, or unhealthful environments can be all around us. Environments that you thought of as being therapeutic, even going to a club to hear music or going to see Niagara Falls, those, those, those environments, well, going to see Niagara Falls, for, I went to see Niagara Falls back in February of 21 and there was no one there. So it was a totally different experience than it had been before. So even large scale outdoor environments have been redefined in the pandemic. 
Right. And, and on the point about people want understanding more about how the environment affects their health, I, the, I guess it then becomes a question of does the, how does this, does this mean more suburbs? <laughs> and of course, this, this means that individuals who can afford to alter their domestic environments can do so. But maybe on the question about healthcare and schools, because I know, Anne-Marie, you might also have something to add to that. But, but either way, Anne-Marie, how would you like to think about how health is being changed, our approach to it. Well, I just maybe would add something to the interesting things that Beatrice and um, Stephen have already said. I'm just taking notes here. One thing that we haven't really talked about at all is um, long-term care and uh, the, um, the um, incredible focus and spotlight that COVID put on the horrible conditions of long-term care residences, at least in Canada. They became a kind of um, image of hell and like hospital design, long-term care has been shunned by architects. It's the lowest possible project in terms of you know, the chain of prestige. And we really have to change that. We have to teach long-term care projects in schools of architecture. We have to give awards, projects have to be published. Um, I think, I really hope that that's going to change. Uh, and that's that's a kind of special institution that's between the home and the hospital typologically, but it just has never had any kind of innovative thinking. And then I just like to add something about um, this interesting idea of um, pandemic shaping cities and buildings over time. Because one of the things that um, we found in our study of tuberculosis and architecture in particular is that the time that the medical theories and the architectural theories don't exactly line up. There's almost always this kind of hangover effect from the last pandemic. Um, and so for example, with tuberculosis, when streptomycin was developed in the early 1940s, which practically eradicated it, we still had this expectation that chest hospitals and TB sands, anything to do with breathing should have balconies and be fresh air based. And you can see that too with the end of the miasma theory that we continue to build pavilion plan hospitals into the 1930s. So I think maybe we are still, as Beatrice so beautifully showed, living in this kind of <laughs> layered hangover of the 1918 flu, which is so interesting. Yeah, so I totally agree. We are still living in that paradigm. It's the success of modern architecture is still today because many villages, even when I show these houses of the Corbusier to people that have never seen, uh, that are not familiar with it, it, they look to them like they were done yesterday, right? So we're wow. still living in this paradigm. So it was so uh, dominant uh, that, uh, and ironically enough, COVID, um, somehow had an effect as well, because all of a sudden to have outside the space, to have a terror, to have air coming, uh, that was good. That was actually, yes. it was working. Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting because on the one hand, there is this that you say beautifully that TB, it was understood as a house problem, right? Uh, all the doctors of the 19th century described tuberculosis as a house problem. So the house is the enemy and we have to clean it and we have to open the windows and we have to eliminate the carpets and, and the curtains and open the windows and have terraces and everything, right? And here we have the opposite situation because the enemy was in public, in the uh -huh. streets, in public transportation, in big cities, all of a sudden big cities are a problem, right? I love big cities, so um, you wouldn't catch me in a sure bed, but anyway, um, or alive. But uh, 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 this is interesting because it was a reversal, but at the yeah. same time, the question of the balcony, uh, which is an architectural element, basically to bring the outside indoors, uh, it was as relevant uh, with COVID in a different way, but as relevant as it had been uh, during tuberculosis uh, crisis, right? Yeah, so I just found myself thinking when you were showing those beautiful chairs, what would a chair for COVID be like? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it's connected it, it to Zoom. For COVID chairs. It's a, it's a COVID. Zoom, yeah, connected to Zoom somehow. Um, I'm just, uh, 
Anne Marie, because you mentioned the the long term care facility as well, I'm just going to drop in the chat an amazing letter that I know Stephen you wrote to the Minister of Health in Ontario about the hybrid approach that is needed to address long term care that is not just the institutions but also the home care and mm -hmm. um, a hybrid approach is is needed. So thank you for that letter. But yeah. Celeste, uh, for you and health, I mean, with your training and expertise in psychology, you don't need a pandemic to tell you about the importance of mental well-being, uh, mental health and well-being. But how is this changing uh, pers your perspective on this? Well, it's, it's interesting um, that the examples that were brought up, despite a lot of what we've been seeing over the pandemic, how health is being conceptualized, we're always still coming back to the presence or absence of disease. And that's not necessarily the case. And so, um, and what's really interesting about that example is that um, when you look at other definitions and you can look at the World Health Organization's definition, you can look at um, you know, more holistic definitions of health that include things like um, food insecurity or social inequities um, mm -hmm. or any mm -hmm. types of, even find, you know, the financial aspects, access to, to water, to clean air, to all of these types of things, even aspects of the built environment, such as housing um, that are um, amplified in this context. What's, what's interesting kind of looking at these more holistic approaches to definition of health is that often we focus on, again, presence or absence of disease um, or objective health as opposed to subjective health and well-being. And I think that it's important to remember in COVID and the pandemic life and all of the examples that our panel had brought to bear today um, is this idea that health is actually under a broader umbrella term of well-being. And so it's one of, uh, one of the concepts underneath this big concept construct called well-being. And so when you look at that aspect um, and you think about how architecture I don't know necessarily how it changes, but how it actually can start to um, create that opportunity for more directed efforts towards, yes, that ultimate outcome of absence of disease, but how you get there in architecture is interesting. And this is something that we've learned in our interdisciplinary teams um, when we're working specifically in healthcare projects, but it applies within any realm and not just if we're defining something like health or wellness, but the idea that um, often, if you're measuring outcomes, as an example, or trying to capture the design aspirations and what you want to achieve out of an architectural design project, um, often you're looking at that end outcome. So in healthcare uh, facility environments, often the ministry or hospital leadership, um, depending, of course, on the type of facility, um, are focused on these very objective indicators of health. And what's interesting to me is that, barring some examples of, you know, hand washing stations and infection control outcomes, et cetera. Mostly architecture is affecting something in the middle and it's affecting something like a psychological state or it's affecting something like a behavior, for example, physical activity that would then improve, I don't know, your, your heart rate or all types of other, um, you know, your mobility, these types of things. And so I think that perhaps the pandemic in highlighting this concept of wellness and, and psychological well-being really focused on what humans actually need and perhaps contextualizing or concept mapping, just like the students in, in my Ryerson class, um, but also in kind of our, our broader projects, when we take on identifying what are those outcomes we're going to measure, even in something like health, the context, just like architects look at things like the site context and try and document what's happening, what is health in that context or well-being in that context broadly defined? And trying to concept map that out a little bit more so that it can inform design. And so I think um, what I'd hope, you know, in terms of whether it's changed, what I hope will change, and certainly our involvement at Methologica and, and others on interdisciplinary design teams has been to start to really break apart what is happening and capturing not only the user engagement and experience and observations, but concept mapping and redefining those outcomes of interest. And so I would encourage, um, in this case, to, to think more broadly about um, health as a holistic concept, um, because without things like those social relationships, that connectivity, um, you can't have, um, and same things with, you know, individual or community well-being, safety, um, environmental 
climate types of, of factors that affect well-being, um, you can't have that broader health objective outcome without any of that. Um, and so I, I would argue um, to think more broadly about what that means. If I could um, take this back to the, um, the point raised about long-term care environments. Sure. One of the reasons they're so inhumane and unhealthful is that the what's needed is to dematerialize the relationship between the interior and exterior environment or the relationship between the interior realm and the exterior realm. And through its dematerialization, they will allow light, fresh air opportunities for the aged to be outside much more. Because the images that we saw earlier of, of the patient being rolled out to the terrace, the, lar the large terrace as, um, as we saw, and um, Paymo, um, this, the hospital, uh, Alto's hospital um, from 1930, I think it was 1929 or 1930 it opened. And there, that's a dematerialization of the, of the relationship between indoor and outdoor. And to do that from a, on a professional or disciplinary or interdisciplinary basis, we have to have landscape architects working very closely with architects, maybe unlike ever before. And then working more interdependently. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's also, Celeste, I'm very interested in your statement because it addresses one of the questions that came up in the Q&A about the methods. And what you're saying is that the methods actually need to change <laughs> because of what needs to be observed. It's, it's, we're not putting everything under a microscope. Everything isn't a scientific piece of data. But do you want to, you had your hand up, would you like to respond? Sure, I can respond to that. And it's interesting um, in the work that we do in terms of not only, you know, for each project, um, the design aspirations or design intentions of, of any um, design project or architectural project um, really are a function of, of or unique for each project. Um, so we work a lot on the teams to identify what those are and then how do you actually measure those? And, and oftentimes they are, and so sometimes they can be intangible concepts like hope or optimism. And so they seem like they're not quantifiable, but in fact, as a social scientist, um, one thing that, that I do and my colleagues in the field would do is look at how measurement theory really allows us to be able to conceptualize hope and optimism. And so redefining what that is and then creating a metric on a quantifiable scale and taking that measurement in an environment or as a function of a design um, element or feature. And often what we're looking at uh, is that it's not necessarily one design element or one design feature, but it's a collection of them. And so how do you isolate those in a methodological approach? And so that's something that um, we work quite honestly in collaboration with our teams. And as much as you, you need the architects and as much as you need the landscape designers and the clients, um, what I've been noticing on the teams is the myriad of consultants and interdisciplinary team members. And so I would hope that when we look at institutions like you know, our colleagues <laughs> and where we're, we're located, um, you know, U, U of T, Princeton, Ryerson, University X, um, elsewhere is, is really how do we start to change the field in terms of the education and training so that it becomes even more holistic in terms of how the field uh, is integrating these different disciplines within, within their projects. Um, I had my hand up because of something that Stephen had mentioned and, and also it was more of an example around long-term care but I noticed it in hospitals as well. And it reminded me a lot of our work on healthcare projects. When we look at functional program and function often, um, you know, it's, it's all tied together, but it often supersedes some of the more humane aspects or human aspects of behavior. And we saw that in terms of within the pandemic, the function of isolating patients. Um, taking someone to emergency, which we had to do actually with a family member um, recently. And so you cannot go in with that family member. And so in long-term care, we saw all kinds of suffering in terms of the psychological state. If people can't see their loved ones, if you don't have that physical contact, if you don't have the ability to have that interconnection um, or reminders of something outside of your hospital and facility, um, it actually affects all types of psychological and mental health well beings that then result in various outcomes um, in terms of health and well being. Uh, it affects those outcomes. And as a psychologist or social psychologist, we've done all kinds of studies around optimism and hope and resiliency and what that actually does in terms of um, adherence to medications, adherence to rehabilitation, um, 
the will to live. And so you're engaged with the medical care. It, and so it's it, kind of how do you create these opportunities within design to affect all of those pieces? interesting challenge a metric for hope can one ever have enough hope over <laughs> spilling the edge i hope among architects Where did, I you, know did you hear about alto i mean alto designing by him he's specifically talking about using particular colors to evoke optimism or even in sunny cloud exactly. you know how cold it is in in paimio and how dark is the winter in, in paimio and and so if the point here is that Architects are thinking about, about this, have been thinking for a long time. And I think part of what the students need to learn in a school is that there are precedents for all of this. We are not in because this is a real problem that every time um, uh, we think that we are inventing the wheel, we are not. And, and, and to think about all these ways, I mean, we may have left uh, uh, some things behind that were so valuable, but it's also important to think that, uh, that things are happening in terms of long-term care. For example, you may have seen, it was published, I think, in the New York Times or somewhere, I mean, uh, these villages that are being developed in, um, in the Netherlands for Alzheimer's uh, patients with a kind of <laughs> like a, a little bit like new urbanism, you know, these villages that evoke like a, a, a small town uh, okay. with the bus uh, stop and the little grocery thing and so on. So uh, despite the fact that the bus stop is not going anywhere, so it's a little bit like the Truman Show. You you can get in, <laughs> you can wait for the, for the bus and the bus may go, but Apparently, even people that have never lived in a small town that have are perhaps lived in all their life in Amsterdam um, enjoy this kind of uh, new uh, community in which they have connections with with other uh, people. And, and in uh, I think it was, I don't know what magazine it was now. I may may have been New York Magazine. How all these uh, new kinds of residences for uh, all people in New York are changing and they are dramatically. Uh, more interesting architecturally and all of this. It brings again the question of, of uh, which I think is super relevant, the question of inequality. Who can afford this is the issue, right? Mm -hmm. Not that architects are not paying attention, they are paying attention. These places cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> and response. the government is not paying uh, for them or is not paying to the extent that they should be uh, support, supporting. That's, that's a different issue. Uh, but uh, I think... Uh, I think uh, experiments are, are happening um, uh, I, I, and very specifically for uh, not only long-term patients, but long-term patients with Alzheimer's, with a very particular uh, situation. And, and these uh, villages that allows them to have some form of uh, dignified life and some form of control over their in, environment. So on, on this topic of the radical change, but also reaching back into our discipline to pull forward the examples can, that can best guide us, we're going to go around and each of you are going to have 15 seconds to tell us about a radical change, which is a question that came in the Q&A, about a radical change that you suggest in the process of thinking and teaching architecture. And this might address the idea also about, you know, what's to come of our discipline? Will it survive or will it succumb? Um, mm. So let's leave the, the, the student audience and the entire audience with a with a nugget takeaway. Maybe Anne Marie, would you like to begin? Does it does it involve teaching architecture to, in the in the medical field? Yeah. So I stuck that in the chat because I was thought we might not have time, but I I I really believe that we have to um, educate people outside of schools of architecture about architecture. We're such an insular profession. We wonder why our work isn't valued. It's because uh, we're talking to ourselves. So when I was director of the school, I made this one of my priorities. And when I stopped being director, I sought a co-appointment in the faculty of medicine so that I could teach medical students about architecture. And it's a, it's a popular class and I hope they'll make wise architectural decisions. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for helping us to make wiser decisions. Stephen, what about you? Well, in terms of, of the curricula, we need, to, we need to have interdisciplinary courses. I've taught an interdisciplinary seminar, the history and theory of architecture and health for over 20 years at three, three universities in the States and in Canada. And it's great to have the physicians in the class, the nurses, the public health students there, the psychology students, uh, urban geographers. It's been a really interesting experience, not only for them, 
but for the architecture students. And they, it's, a, it's a true mutual win-win. Uh, now, and the larger picture, architects are terrible first responders. I saw this firsthand in Hurricane Katrina. My house flooded. I was teaching at Tulane University. It was, I didn't sleep in my own bed for three months. It was really bad. But it was, it was the first catastrophe I experienced firsthand. The pandemic is the second. We've all experienced that. But these natural disasters are much more episodic geographically, but no less impactful in many levels, physically and psychologically. So the schools are doing a horrible job of teaching architects to think as first responders, a absolutely horrible job. And we have to do better. We need courses. We need a required design studio or required electives that can teach architects to think quickly and to anticipate the need for disaster mitigation and in, uh, architectural interventions to, um, because we're doing, we're just, the engineers have just run us off the road. Anticipatory, I like it. And I have a feeling that University X must be doing something right because these student leaders chose you all who are transdisciplinary thinkers to this panel. Celeste, what is one of the radical changes you would suggest in architectural oh. teaching? Well, as um, a non-architect who is, I'm a social psychologist who's no longer teaching in social psychology. I'm a non-architect te teaching in architecture. Um, I would say that what's really interesting is this idea, um, not that architects need to be even more ambitious, but they can be anything and they have a greater social responsibility. They may not necessarily end up being architects designing one specific type of building, for example. So I think that's a radical shift in thinking. Um, to your point, my 15 seconds, I won't time it, but um, around this idea of whether um, you know we're creating projects or design um, or architecture that will lead us to succumb or to survive. I think we're all surviving at this point, I hope for the most part, some of us might be succumbing a little bit at various times, um, but in the stress coping and resiliency literature, we talk a lot about how we're going to thrive. And so I would encourage architects and uh, trainees and the field as a whole to think about, um, you know, architecture is very optimistic and hopeful and utopian uh, in, its, in its nature. And so how, how do you actually introduce these concepts so that individuals, buildings, communities, climate can thrive. Thank you, Celeste. Beatrice, you have a multi-year project on radical pedagogies. Can you boil it down to 15 seconds? <laughs> radical pedagogy is a whole thing, because that's a lot. Uh, well, collaborating with the students in, in multidisciplinary projects of, of research has been really very important to me. So I will, for example, point out historically that now that we are talking to matters of health, uh, that the students can always make a difference, and this is very important. For example, I will give you just one example from Radical Pedagogies, which is the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley at that time, in the 60s and 70s, was called the creep capital of America because of the number of uh, people returning from the Korean War, from the Vietnam War, etc., uh, uh, with all kinds of uh, disabilities, right? And they were activists, they were protesting on, on campus for um, independent, having in the, an independent life and accessible campus. And it was precisely the students of uh, architecture and some uh, professors that team up with these uh, activists in order to redesign the campus and design housing uh, that was uh, adequate for, for, uh, for their needs. And you know, uh, this is in the 60s, but it led to the American with Disabilities Act of 1990, I don't know what year it was, 95 maybe. So it took a long, long time. But if you go back at the beginning of the American with Disabilities Act, you have the activism of students of architecture with uh, 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 disabled in individuals coming back from, from the world. So activism, I think is, um, is important. Uh, you can make a difference. There are so many uh, uh, important things in which you can uh, participate, that you can uh, make a big uh, uh, difference, a huge problems uh, that as, uh, as has been said here, the question of health is, is not just a question of the health of the individual body, but all these other uh, questions, including affordable housing and access to, to, to healthcare. And, and um, in the question of affordable housing, maybe also the architects uh, can do a lot, right? Thank you, Beatrice. And on this note of student empowerment, we're going to turn things back to the students to close things out. And apologies for not being able to read aloud all of the questions, but we'll, we will copy them and save them for the panelists. Uh, okay, thank you. Jeanette and Jasmine, over to you. 
So uh, thank you all for a really great conversation and presentations. And thank you, Emory, Stephen, Celeste, Beatrice, for your amazing presentations, and Lisa for a very well-run discussion. <laughs> We'd also like to thank our faculty DAS, the IT team, Master of Architecture Program Rep uh, Marco Polo, as well as our sponsors for making this event possible. And thank you everyone for coming out to our symposium today. And we hope that these conversations today spark new ones for you and that you would, it'll inspire new ideas for you in the future. And this is a great experience. Thank you all again for coming. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Congratulations. Nice to see you all.